Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 14. The Apostle Paul writes, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him, read with me verse number 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Read verse 21, if you would, too. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. My subject tonight, just simply, preach me bigger. The Lord gave me those three words, preach me bigger, or preach Jesus bigger. Amen. To all of our guests here tonight and those that are watching online, Amen. We have several people watching all over the United States, and so we welcome you to Firstborn Ministries, and we pray that you would just receive the Word of God tonight and that the blessings of God would reach out to where you're at. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the Word again. Your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We know that the Word of God is yes and amen. And so, Lord, tonight I pray that as the Word is preached, that faith would rise in the hearts of the men and the women that are listening. For you said that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We're believing, Lord, that there is an anointing that is here that would reach into the hearts and the lives of every man and woman, and that that anointing would break every yoke, whatever that yoke is, that it would be broken, and that we would walk in the liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for causing your will to be done in this place tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, preach me bigger. Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When I look at the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is the, one of the prison epistles written by the Apostle Paul. And when Paul writes the uh, writing that we had read here tonight in Ephesians chapter 3, it was not in an ivory palace. It was not in a place where he was sitting up in some hotel and eating uh, hamburgers and french fries or whatever else it is that people would eat. But he was sitting in a jail cell whenever he had written this particular pistol. It, uh, if it would have been me, I would have been tempted to wonder if maybe I was doing things correctly. Anybody ever get into a situation and, and um, things begin to go wrong in your life as a Christian and suddenly you begin to say, God, what did I do wrong? And, and where have I gone wrong? And Lord, what is it that you want me to do? It may be that the problems that you're having are not indicative of something that you have done wrong, but it may be that problems that you're having are indicative of something that you are doing right. Somebody say amen. You see, the devil will fight you to where God is wanting you to be at and where he is taking you. And so if he sees you going in a direction and he sees you growing in God in a certain way, he's going to fight you in that area. And he's going to try to veer you off from the path that God wants you to be able to be on. And so Paul is not in jail because of something that he had done uh, uh, wrong, but he is in jail simply because he was a believer and he spoke out for the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, if we're, if we're, not, if we're not careful, we are tempted to, uh, when we get in those times, to begin to feel sorry for ourselves. Uh, sometimes we second guess what God is doing in our lives. Uh, and I have been that way. When people would choose to quit church or go in a different direction, when a service does not go right, or someone gets mad because of something that is preached or something that is taught, uh, amen, and or someone does not show up, amen, it would uh, cause me at times as a pastor to say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? What, 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 what is going on? And then, uh, then I realized the fickleness that is there in my heart and in the lives of men and women in 2014. We have got to understand that the Lord has not called us to be popular all the time. But our message at times is going to be very unpopular. Jesus said, if they hated me, then they're also going to hate you. And 
Could it be that in our society in 2014, we're wanting to smile and we're wanting to bless everybody, and we're not willing to say what God wants us to say because we're afraid that somebody's going to get mad about that. And yet God has called us to be able to stand up and to speak sometimes things that will go against the grain of humanity. Paul was not all about numbers and making people feel good. He was about Jesus Christ and making people saved. That's what he was all about. It appears that Paul really did not care if you liked him. He had kind of this attitude, if you like me, fine. If you don't like me, too bad. So what? I don't care either. Amen. That's what Paul's attitude was like. It takes just a very casual reading of, of his letters to find out that uh, he was a guy who was straightforward. And you probably wouldn't want Paul to be your pastor because he would love on you one minute and he would slap you upside your head the next minute. Somebody say amen. Amen. He will, uh, he will pat you on the back one minute and then he'll kick you in the seat of your pants uh, the next minute. But that's what a father does. Amen. That's what men do whenever they care for their family. They say it like it is. And it appears that Paul was kind of a rough and a straightforward man. You remember how he came in? He was a guy that persecuted the church of God. He hated the church and he hated the name of Jesus Christ. He put people to death. All that he could that believed in the name of the Lord. But one day... He had a visitation from Almighty God that would turn him around. One day, he would have a visitation from God that would change his theology, his philosophy, and it would change most of all his heart. Acts 9, it tells the story of his conversion. And, and uh, he was knocked to the ground, if you'll remember. And, and he was blinded for three days. And yet, in that blindness, when he looked up in his eyes, he could not see anything. He cried, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord shouted back to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And it was then that he had a face-to-face -face meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he found out that the one that he was persecuting and the one that was fighting against was the one that really was the God of eternity, the God that he really needed to know, learn about and needed to get saved by. His conversion was not, well, I think that I got saved. I think that last week, I think God got a hold of my heart. But you can be sure that when Paul got saved, there was no doubt in his mind that we got up from that uh, Damascus experience and his eyes were opened he didn't walk away there saying well I signed the church roll book that day he didn't say I shook the preacher's hand no he walked away from there saying I met the Lord Jesus Christ and he touched me in the bottom of my heart I believe that's the problem today. Too many people, they think that they got saved. They get a little bit of a religious experience and they go, whoop, glory, I must have gotten saved. And then they go out and they're the same as they always was. There's no change of heart. There's no change of mind. There's no turning around and turning towards the things of God. Some say, well, I prayed the prayer of uh, the sinner's prayer, whatever that is. I got wet in the baptistry. But I want, what I want to know is when you prayed the sinner's prayer and when you got wet in the baptistry, were you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? And when you went down, did you believe that all of your sins were washed away? Did you put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? What I'm trying to tell you tonight is did you have a divine visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ so that He touched you so deeply and so profoundly when you got up from there you can say there's a new man walking in my shoes therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things are become new did you get that kind of salvation if not you need to go back again and you need to kneel once again until God touches you from the bottom of your heart and changes you from who you are to what he wants you to be I'm telling you, God is still doing that today. Paul had that kind of conversion. And when he got saved, not only did God save him, but God called him to preach. I believe that God can call people to preach even before that they are saved. Even before they come to Him, God can speak to you and tell you what He wants you to do. I remember I was called to preach 
When I was probably 12 or 13 years old, I was not saved. I wouldn't get saved until I was almost 19 years old. And probably one of the reasons why I didn't want to get saved is because I knew that God had the call to preach on my life. And I did not want to preach. I did not want to do that. And yet, in this day, when Paul was saved, God put His hand upon him and He says, I'm going to show Paul how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And on that day that he was baptized, and on that day that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the hand of God settled down upon him to be able to place the call to preach upon his life. Some of you might have even felt the call of God upon your life and you've ran from that call thinking that you cannot do it because you've looked only within yourself and you've not looked unto Almighty God. Amen. Some of you might be sitting here tonight and maybe you have acknowledged that call of God to ministry, but you have replaced that call of God with other things in your life, and you are some. Uh, uh, and when that happens, we become some of the most miserable individuals in our own selves uh, that ever was, because the way of a transgressor is hard. The Bible says, and what that means is when we choose to go an opposing way to what God has called us to go, we run against that uh, almost like rough sandpaper, and we go against the grain we swim against the current and it becomes very disheartening and discouraging amen and we live a life of disappointment and yet Paul said I am called of God he didn't immediately jump into the pulpit and some of you that are called to preach you need to wait upon your calling just because you're called doesn't mean that it's your time as of yet just because God placed his hand upon you doesn't mean that the pastor is going to step aside and say there you go Stand up and tell us what you think. No, there has to be a, a maturing and there has to be a seasoning. There has to be a growth. And Paul went to the backside of the desert, the Word of God says, for three years. And there... He listened to the voice of God and he studied and he prayed and he sought God. And so profound was this time away in the college of God that when he arrived back to where the Jerusalem council was at, he was preaching the same message that they preached and he was teaching the same lessons that they taught. And the reason why is because God is the one that was teaching that early church elders and God would speak speak to Paul and say, this is the message that I want you to teach as well. And yet Paul would find out that I'm going to have to suffer some things because of the call of God on my life. Can I tell the preachers tonight, there may be some suffering that you have to do. And if you're not willing to suffer, and if you're not willing to be lonely many times, and be misunderstood, and be misquoted, and be set aside, and walk by yourself, you're probably not not going to make it. I'm not talking about being a hermit and saying, amen, I'm just antisocial, but I'm talking about if you're a preacher and God placed His hand upon you, you are a strange and a peculiar individual. No one is going to understand you, amen, like the other preachers and like God will understand you. And there will be a certain amount of suffering that you are going to have to go through that maybe some others will not have to go through. I remember dear brother Irwin who has long since passed on. He was the secretary for the district of the United Pentecostal Church. And the man was full of wisdom and full of anecdotes. He was a professor in mathematics. He was an amazing man. He would sit in the business meetings and they would shout out or they would talk numbers and they would, they would just speak. You could give him 1,530, 2,175, 632, 27,675 and multiply that by three. And within just a second, that man had like a computer mind. He was as fast as the computers. He would come up and he said, this is the answer. He was a mathematics genius my friend. He was an amazing man to be around. And I remember sitting with him one day in his cabin and he said, Brother Maynard, whenever I was in Bible college, he said, I have the call of God upon my heart. And we were there with other young men 
in that Bible college. And he said, I remember this one guy that used to always pray, and he was just a little bit weirder than the rest of the people. He said he was always a loner. He was by himself. But we would hear him pray in the chapel services this prayer. Oh, God, help me to suffer for you. Oh, God, help me to suffer for you. And he said, we listened to that guy, and we thought, that guy is crazy. We don't want to suffer for the Lord. We don't want that. And he said, you know what? He said, I've been out of Bible college for 45 years. And he said, when I look at my life, and I did not want to suffer. And he says, and I look at his life, and he said, Lord, help me to suffer for you. He says, I look at that man, and I see that God has used that man in a tremendous way. But he's paid a tremendous price. And so it was with Paul. We say, God, make me like the Apostle Paul. Are you willing to suffer like the Apostle Paul? Are you willing to be misunderstood like the Apostle Paul? Are you willing to stand up and declare the Word of God for Almighty God like the Apostle Paul? Listen to his testimony. As in 2 Corinthians 11, he said to the people, I was a Hebrew. I said, an Israelite. He says, and uh, I am also the seed of Abraham. He says, I am a minister of Christ in verse number 23. He says, I have been more stripes above measure. I've been in prison more than anybody. I've been more frequent where my life was threatened. Of the Jews, five times I was whipped with 39 stripes upon my back. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. I've been in journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own kind countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, and among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often. I've been cold, and I've been hungry, and I've been thirsty, and I've fasted often, and I've been naked a few times also. And he says, all of this I've gone through, and yet Paul stood, and he said, none of these things move me. I still count it a privilege to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pause here just for a moment and let me ask us in 2014 beginning with myself. I've already asked myself this question this day. Am I still happy that I'm a part of the church of God? Am I still glad that I made the decision 48 years ago that I would go and I would kneel at the cross and Christ met me there? Or somehow has that, 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 that loving and longing desire to be a part of the church as it worn thin and has my experience waned just a little bit it. I'm here to tell you tonight amen if that's the truth we need to go back to the altar of prayer and we need to pick up again where we left off and we need to say God renew in me a right spirit and create in me a clean heart let the power of the Holy Ghost come and burn inside of my heart once again I am I am concerned that in 2014 that we have the truth of God and that we stand upon the word of God and and we are separated. And yet I am concerned that there is the loss of the fire for the things of God. Our fire, our zeal, our enthusiasm, it has been misplaced in some cases. And all of our zeal and our power, our strength, it is spent on something else. Nothing wrong with doing other things. But can I tell you, we need to come back to our heartfelt experience and zeal and commitment to the kingdom of God once again we need to spend the energy that we have in the things of God amen and when we do so the revival that we say is there it will come nigh into our heart we need to begin to draw a circle around ourselves and say God don't let the revival begin in my brother or sister don't let it begin in the preacher but draw a circle around yourself and say dear God let the fire begin with me let me once again be filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I hear John say these words. I indeed baptize you 
with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, and whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Come on, church. Whatever happened to the fire of the Holy Ghost, is it still burning on the inside of you? I've got a fire. I've got a fire. I've got a fire that's burning inside of me. Burn all fire of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul said, Paul said, who is weak and I'm not weak. You say, I've got problems all, oh, but the fire of God still needs to be in your heart. Paul said, who is weak and I'm not weak. Who is offended and I burn not if I need the glory. I will glory concerning my infirmities. Paul said, I remember being let down in a basket over a city wall. I didn't know who was holding the ropes, but thank God somebody cared enough to lower me down to safety. I wasn't in that good a shape, but somebody cared enough to put me in a basket and to send me on on my way and get me to a place of protection. You say, but I've got problems internally, Paul said. I've got, I've got a thorn in my flesh. And some say it was his eyesight which it could have been because everywhere he went he had a group of followers that was with him to help him and when you read the books that Paul had written you'll see that they were written not by the hand of Paul but they were written by someone that was a scribe for Paul and the, and the expositors say that the reason why is because Paul could not see to write and yet in the book of Galatians he said you see how large a letter that I have written I have written it with mine own hand and yet I still believe that it went deeper than maybe a physical infirmity. I believe that the infirmity of Paul was the remembrance of who he was and what he had done. The condemnation that visited him daily when he looked into the faces of those and moms and dads uh, that he had killed their children uh, or the children that he had killed their moms and dads uh, it haunted him I believe every day uh, and he prayed dear God take this away from me uh, I sought the Lord three times uh, and I said God take this away uh, and yet the Lord said unto him in verse number 9 uh, my grace is sufficient for thee uh, my strength is made perfect uh, in your weakness uh, and Paul didn't moan and groan about it uh, he picked up his head and he said most gladly therefore then I will rejoice in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest on me what I'm telling you tonight is that things might not be all the way that they should be you might not be as perfect as you want to be things might not be lined up as you want them to be lined up amen and you've sought God and you've prayed and God has not answered the prayer like you want you've got two choices Choices. You can either throw up your hands and you can quit. You can wave the white flag of surrender and say, I give up and lose out with God. Or you can back up and say, in the name of Jesus, he might not have answered me the way that I want, but I will praise God. I will glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ, it may be made manifest. What Paul was saying is that we need to preach Jesus bigger than we've ever preached him. He's bigger than our problems. He's bigger than our situation. He's bigger than our sickness. He's bigger than our, 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 our discomfort. He is a God that can do exceeding. And so I come to our text tonight. The Bible says, for this cause, Paul said, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, you might comprehend Amen. Comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. Amen. And the love of God. Amen. Paul then said this. Now unto him that is able 
to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Here's what Paul was getting at. Amen. He was saying God wants to grant you strength through the power of the Holy Ghost. He said God wants to grant you a comprehension. Amen. Of the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of his love. Do you know the love of God? Amen. You say no. I'm so far away from God. I can't even hear God. God, can I tell you the Lord is knocking on your door and he's saying come on child of God you're not as far away as you think that you are you've been listening to the wrong voice and the voice has been saying God is done with you God is fed up with you God is disappointed in you I've come to tell you you're listening to the wrong voice I hear the voice of God that says beloved now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear that we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is I hear the voice of God that says fear not little flock for it's the father's good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom I hear the voice of God that says behold I've set before you the ways of life and the ways of death choose life choose life choose life somebody say it choose life that's what the voice of God is saying. That's what our churches need to hear today. God is not done with you. God has not set you on the back burner. You set yourself there. And the Lord is saying, come on, little teapot. Get back on the fire and start whistling once again. Amen. Your teapot is not broken. You just lost the fire underneath it. Amen. You've still got the water of the Spirit. But you need to get back on the fire so the teapot can start singing again come on little teapot get on the fire and sing yes. hallelujah and then Paul said I want you to know that your God is able to do more than you can ask with your mouth or think with your mind I believe Paul was saying preach Jesus Christ bigger I believe the Lord was saying to me Wendell, you need to preach me bigger. The Holy Ghost is telling us, believe Jesus Christ can do more than you can even think in your mind. You will never be able to make Him bigger than He is. You really will not. But it is possible to make Him smaller than He is in our lives. Nothing I say will make Him bigger Amen. than He is. He's as big as He will ever be. But you can minimize God in your own life by saying, oh, I don't think God can do that. I don't think God will hear me and then God has a stop sign because God is moved by faith or you can cause that faith to rise and then you can turn almighty God loose in your life and you can say I believe God can do anything God can heal God can deliver God can transform God can fill with the Holy Ghost God can bring revival God can turn a church in the right direction my God can Preach me bigger. Preach me bigger. The book said according to the power that works in you. What is the power that works in you? It's the power of faith. It's the power of Holy Ghost. Amen. That rises in you and says, I believe God can. The power of faith. It brought you to the church. The power of faith. It brought you to a place where you said, I believe that when I repent, God, He will forgive me of my sins. And so when you knelt in that bedroom, that altar, in that bathroom, bathroom in your car and you said Lord I'm a sinner forgive me right then and there you had a visitation from God you didn't have to ask if you were forgiven but you knew you were forgiven because when faith reaches up and touches God ha, ha, something happens amen and a move of God takes place in your life you remember when you went to the altar amen and then you felt your need to be baptized you said my God how in the world can water amen I'm not going to the water I'm going to get my hair messed up I'll look like a drowned rat amen you know I spent a hundred dollars on my hair too amen I don't want my hair to get messed up well what do you want more a hundred dollar hairdo or a million dollar salvation experience oh come on somebody amen what I'm telling you is this 
God doesn't cut anybody any breaks. Everybody's got to come the same way. You've got to come the water way. You've got to be buried in the name of Jesus. And when that happens, you'll sing the old song. I'm so glad that I've been buried in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. I'm so glad that I've been buried in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord, I've been set free. Oh, come on, somebody. Shout into the Lord just for a minute. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on now. Don't make me do all the work tonight. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our problem is that we don't believe God can anymore. God can't heal our kids. God can't save our kids. God can't give me a better job. God can't straighten out my wife. I mean my husband. God can't straighten out the preacher. God can't straighten out the church. This world, He can't straighten the world out. You see, when you get that attitude, you've got the attitude of the world. Jesus said, He said, there will be wars and rumors of wars and men's hearts failing them for fear. Read it in Luke 21. And what He's saying is there would be a spirit of hopelessness that is in our world. Let me give you some good advice. Stop looking at Fox News and CBN and CNN and get your nose back in the Word of God. God, and hear what the word of God says Jesus said he said their hearts shall fail them for fear but when he hear these things he said look up and lift up your heads because your redemption it draw nigh it's even at the door come on church of God look up look up look up look up I don't care what Alex Jones says. I don't care what Peter Jones or Peter whoever it is, Jennings says. I don't care what Russ Limbaugh says. I don't care what Mark Levin says. I don't care, amen, what Ruth says or, or whoever, or Phil, or whoever those individuals are. Here's what I care. I want to know what the Holy Ghost is saying. I want to hear the news from the voice of the Holy Ghost. We doing all right? One of the best posts I ever read on Facebook, somebody said, we need to, we need to, what did they say? That we need to, uh, uh, what's that? Shut it off? No. They said, uh, what is it whenever you won't go someplace? You're going to do what? You're going to, we need to boycott the news. That's right. Amen. I put on there, amen. I've been doing that for years. I don't care what they say. Who cares? They'll tell you everything's lost and nothing's good. Amen. I'm telling you that the world and, the, and, and, and the, this world has an agenda. Amen. The Democratic Party has an agenda. Amen. The Republican Party has an agenda. The Libertarian Party has an agenda. Amen. And you better not fall into that. If you're more Republican, Democrat, Libertarian than you are Christian, you need to come back to the cross. And you need to put Jesus back on the throne. But we don't believe God can. Our problem is we limit God by our unbelief and by our unwillingness to ask. I remember several years ago when Brother York was building a church in Streeter, Illinois. And um, they were going to do like a build a church in a day. And so we went down there. There were probably 50 guys, 60 guys, 70 guys, something like that. And we were, the, the, the foundation was poured. We were going to put the floor on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the basement. We are going to raise the walls, put the roof up and shingle it all in one day. Put the doors on and dry it all in. That's pretty good, amen? That's a pretty good day's work. And so we got there, and it was about mid-morning or so, and pretty soon, a storm blew in. A storm blew in. And you saw guys begin to load up their tools, saying, thank God, I didn't want to work today anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was that way or not, but... <laughs> And so they started loading up their tools, and, and the presbyter, Brother Coons, he said, Wait! I remember one time reading in the Bible when there was a storm, and Jesus stood up and said, Peace be still. And if Jesus could do that then, then why don't we practice that now and ask him to do it now? 
And so, amen, he got everybody together and he prayed. And in his own way, he never lifts his voice. He lifted his hands and he said, but he speaks with authority. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this storm. We are here to build this church a place where people can worship you. And the devil would send this storm to try and stop that. And Lord, I thank you for rebuking the devil and rebuking this storm in Jesus' name. And everybody just kind of stood around for a few minutes. And wouldn't you know it, it started clearing up. It's, you say, no, it was, a, it was just one of those things. It would have cleared up anyway. <laughs> Amen. How do you know? You ever stood out in a storm saying, oh, it's going to clear up, and you got wetter than a goose. <laughs> or a duck, or whatever. I made that mistake. I went out on my bicycle one time. I said, oh, it ain't going to rain. It rained. I looked like a drowned rat by the time I got back. But he stood there and he rebuked that storm. And I know it, it might sound ridiculous. Amen. But it wasn't ridiculous to the elder. Amen. And he spoke that and God heard him. And it happened. I'm saying that Jesus Christ is saying, preach me bigger. If God could do it then, then God can. And he will do it now. Amen. God is telling me to tell you, tell the people of God once again, I can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that works in you raise the level of your faith understand that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever and I am the Lord he said and I change not and I come to a close here amen tonight amen and just because we preach this and we teach this and I, I'm telling you not to listen to I'm not telling you to ignore. And you say, well, how can we ignore all of the problems that are around us? We can't. We can't deny. Does anybody deny that we are living in perilous times? If so, raise your hands and we need to pray for you. you everybody that believes that we're living in perilous times, all right. You had a few. All right, good. Okay, good. That's what I thought you meant. All right. But here's what the Lord is telling me. I asked the Lord, Lord, why are children killing children? We've never seen that in the magnitude that it is today. Kids just opening fire for no reason. Honor students, amen, for no reason, amen. Why? And Lord, why is it that parents are taking the lives of their children? And he said, here's why. He said, Wendell, it's because hell has cranked up its recruiting system. And hell has unleashed a horde of demons. The reason why these kids are doing that is they get demon-possessed. They are possessed by demon spirits. That's the only answer that I can have for that. There is a devil that is alive and well, and he is moving, and he needs, and what this world needs is a church that has Jesus Christ alive and well in them to be able to put the devil in his place. Why is there a redefinition of marriage today? Why do we have the prescription drug problems and the alcohol problems and the illicit drug problems today? I'll tell you why. Because the spirit of Rome is active and it's well in our world. I look at some of you in the sporting system. Amen. The ungodly cage matches. Putting men against men. The MMA so-called where there's a blood sport and they break arms and they break limbs and people are hurt in that. I think 
of that and I think of the young women that are sold into sex slavery and the great failure of the government. All of this is a sign of the end times in which we live. I hear the words again of Romans 1. Paul reminded us that men would leave the natural use of a woman and women would burn in their lusts for women. The Bible says these men and women are worshipers not of God. They are worshiping not God. They are worshiping the creature more than the creator. Even worse than that, our whole denominations that are okaying and they are ordaining practicing lesbians and homosexuals, they have not read Romans 1 and 28 where the Bible says that the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. They have not read the word of God that says because that which may be known of God is revealed in them for God has showed it into them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse and because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened there it is when they knew God they did not worship him as God something's wrong when major denominations they go away from the word of God and the teachings of the word of God and they ordain men and women into the church saying it's all right and redefining marriage but I'm here to tell you that there's a church there's an army rising up there's an army rising up there's an army rising up and it's going to break every chain break every chain break every chain Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He went on to say, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful in their vain hearts, and they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. They professed themselves to be wise. I'm smarter than everybody else. You guys are outdated. You're antique. You must be, amen, a hate monger. You must be a racist. And if I was a person of color, I would be of the highest insult when they would put men and women that are practicing lesbians and homosexuals and they compare them amen with the races that are in our society saying they're no different no my friend my color I did not choose amen you choose your sexuality and you make those choices yourself you've got to make up your mind I'm saying whether you're going to live for God or you're not going to live for God stop trying to make excuse and let everybody else want to accept what you're doing am I making myself clear It makes me mad whenever I hear them try to use, and, and, and we do, we do have racism in, in America still. It's, oh, there's not. Open your eyes. It is there. It's in every direction. It's in every direction. But God help us. We want to try to use those, those, things that Dr. Martin Luther King marched for, 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 for equality among the races. And we try to say, well, we're going to use that in order to accept and embrace people that live lifestyles that are less than godly. It's wrong. Did we forget about reading in Romans 1? The Bible says, for this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, the men leaving the natural use, verse number 27 of Romans 1, the use of the woman burned in their lust one toward the other, men working that which is unseemly. You know what the Bible says in verse 28? And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate or an unacceptable mind. Said, so you want to think that way? Go ahead. And to do the things that are not convenient. But in the midst of all of that, Paul said, you know what? I know there are problems. But I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. I can, I'm here to tell you that every adulterer can be saved. 
Every alcoholic can be saved. Every drug addict can be saved. Every homosexual can be saved. Every lesbian can be saved. Every liar can be saved. Every thief can be saved. Every murderer can be saved. Paul said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, and he gives a whole list of men and women. But then he stops and said, Lest you get prideful in your own way. He says, And such were some of you. But you are lost. You are sanctified. And you are justified in the name of the Lord by the Spirit of our God. That's what it takes, my friend. You want to be saved? you got to be saved through the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, preach me bigger. Preach me bigger. All right, and I'm done. I, I got more, but I'm done. No, no, I'm done. I want you to come next Sunday night, so I'm going to quit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The year was 1964, Madison Square Garden. Were you there in New York? Were you around then? I was six years old. The long awaited and highly publicized match of the century, hailed by many to be the greatest of all times, Cassius Clay. Remember Cassius Clay? Repeatedly declared that I am the champion. I am the champion. I am the champion. The reigning champ at the time was Sonny Liston. When the bell finally rang, signaling the start of the fight, the fighters came out hurling punch after punch in the first round when suddenly Cassius Clay connected and he knocked Sonny Liston, his opponent, to the canvas with a flurry of lefts and rights. The crowd stood and they shouted and screamed. The thunderous applause that was there was deafening. Then, while Sonny Liston lie there, knocked out, Cassius Clay stood over his opponent and he shouted, I am the greatest! Anybody remember that? I am the greatest. I am the greatest. Every time I tell that, every time I read that story, I'm like, <laughs> it does something to me. You know, he was the underdog coming in there, and, he, and uh, he just went in there and tore it up. When I heard that story, it reminded me of another battle that had been fought and won. The devil, the enemy of our soul deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. For 4,000 years continued the deception until one day a baby was born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said he was the mighty God. He was the everlasting Father. That day all of the hordes of hell, they looked on and the angels of heaven looked over the banister of heaven they stepped into the ring. The ring was a place called Calvary. The ring was a place called Pilate's Praetorium, Pilate's Hall. And one by one, the blows were landed upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the cruel Roman soldiers slapped him and they beat him with a cat of nine tails. And finally, they, they placed a, a homemade crown of thorns upon his head and a makeshift robe upon his back and said, Hail, King of the Jews, giving him a reed in his hands. Not too long after that, they grabbed him and they drug him and made him carry the cross to the place called Golgotha. I spoke about that this morning. There on that cruel cross, he was nailed as a common criminal. But he was not a common criminal. He was the Lamb of God that was taking away the sins of the world. And as they nailed him there and he hung upon the cross, he cried, My God! My God! Why hast thou forsaken me? And he felt the weight of all of the sins of the world as it bore down upon his humanity. And he was feeling what it was like. That human man, Christ Jesus, was feeling what it was like to be forsaken of God. 
and have all of the sins of all of the world that ever had been or ever would be placed upon him there at the cross. It was about the ninth hour and the Bible says that he looked up and just before he expired, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then he said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost and his head was hung low. Shortly thereafter, the Roman soldiers came and speared him in the side and out came blood and water. They knew that he was dead and they pulled him down from the cross and Mary and Martha, they begged the body of the Lord and they carried him to the tomb and there they dressed him and they anointed him with aloes and myrrh and the Bible says that they laid him there and they sealed that tomb and Pilate and Herod were so concerned that, that this man, Jesus, would rise again from the dead that he set soldiers at the, at, the, at, the, at the tomb and commanding that no one would go therein. Yet, the battle raged. It seemed as though that the master had lost and the enemy of our soul had won. Yet, after three days, the Bible says that life came back into the Lord Jesus Christ. And he rose from the dead and the stone was rolled away. And the Bible says that he appeared unto above 500 brethren for almost 50 days, 43, 47 days to prove with many, many infallible proofs that he was alive. And it was on that day when he rose from the dead that I can hear the master say, I am the greatest. <laughs> I am the greatest. I am, the, how many knows he is the great I am? There is none above him. There's none beside him. And the master is saying tonight, because I live, you can live. And because I rose from the dead, I can raise you from the death of your sins. And I can cause you to change your destination from hell to the place called heaven. But you've got to believe me. You've got to preach me bigger than your problem. Is there anyone that would like to come and just stand and just seek the Lord for a few moments of time? Oh, Jesus, 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 oh, Jesus, 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 oh, Jesus.